Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Um, as uh, Thank you for the introduction. I'm Sean. I'm from the University of Waterloo in Canada. And today I'll be talking about a new type of approach to engineer improved enzymes um, for uh, thermostability so that they can be used in industrial applications, for example, carbon capture. Okay, so enzymes, one of their big advantages is that they're sustainable catalysts. But they have some major hurdles, and that's why we don't see them uh, extremely frequently in industry. And one of the main hurdles there is their thermostability. So they, we often have to engineer them because they are only designed to operate within, you know, the cell of an organism that they involved in. And so we might have to mutate them in order to improve their thermostability. So my specific goal in this presentation that I'll discuss is to develop an ultra-stable carbon capturing enzyme. And I'll show you a new series of deep learning approaches that we can use to achieve better results when we're trying to do this. So to give you a bit of background, uh, the top anthropogenic source of carbon dioxide emission is from flue gas. And I'm sure you guys can imagine many other uh, places where uh, uh, carbon dioxide in, in concentrated areas is released uh, throughout the gas refining process. Um, one strategy that has been used in order to try to reduce the amount of uh, emission that actually gets into the atmosphere is point source capture using things like amine-based solvents. But the problem is the kinetics of absorption from those solvents uh, gets traded off from the ability to release carbon dioxide from those solvents in order to then capture it and, uh, you know, store it later on. Um, so, you know, a major way to accelerate that, if we could, would be to use enzymes uh, that can speed up that reaction significantly. And of course, as I said, the problem is that those enzymes don't tend to be stable. It's not very economically viable because uh, those enzymes will lose activity over time as they become unfolded. Uh, so briefly, I just want to mention, uh, you know, in case it's been a long time since you've taken a, a biochemistry course or something like that, or maybe never, uh, an enzyme is just a sequence of amino acids. These are uh, different types of chemical functions, and they get folded, you know, it's a string, and it gets folded into a complex three-dimensional shape. And the goal of that shape is to orient certain functions in a way that you can facilitate the catalysis of uh, certain molecules. And, you know, for this uh, application, I'll be looking at um, SAS carbonic anhydrase, and this is a uh, an enzyme coming from an already thermophilic organism. And the one of the advantages here is this is one of the fastest, this is the fastest known enzyme for uh, carbon dioxide uh, capture. Uh, it, it, a single enzyme molecule can perform a million or more reactions a second already. Um, and it does this by the nucleophilic attack of a zinc polarized hydroxyl ion that's facilitated by the structure of the enzyme, the way it was evolved. Um, so if we were to further engineer its stability uh, uh, to uh, apply it to industrial environments, we could get uh, longer term use of these catalysts uh, before they are degraded um, and you know, at the same time get that renewable effect. So the traditional way that we would do this is to just sort of brute force apply mutations, change the residues within the protein and try to achieve a higher stability through you know, random discovery. Uh, that's sort of the way that nature does it because it's randomly applying mutations all the time. But to actually characterize all these mutations is, you know, prohibitively expensive, um, especially in terms of time, but it, as well as the cost. Um, and so we can try to do more targeted engineering of enzymes with rational design, where maybe we look for opportunities to introduce covalent bonds through uh, different types of mutations. Uh, but these are very challenging to introduce, and, and they still take a lot of human time, um, and they might not even be successful. So we can move to the in silico side of things and try to pre-screen some mutations based on some model of stability. You know, you have this uh, sequence stability relationship with a protein and you want to understand it. But the problem with these models is we only have, you know, enough training data for, you know, thousands of mutations across, you know, only a few hundred proteins. And, and you know, the amount of proteins that we're actually considering uh, are, you know, on the orders of tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. And so they're not going to generalize to all of these different options. And they also tend to be highly biased to properties, other properties that improve thermal stability, but reduce the solubility. We need an aqueous solvent. So we need the enzyme to be working in, in water a lot of the time or a similar solvent um, and even lose stability as well. Okay, so we wanted to know how can we better engineer um, mutants to test? How can we screen things in silico and know that they're going to be more successful when we actually try to test them? And so our approach was to select mutations that are 
plausible given their biological context. So I'll explain what I mean a bit there, but the topic here is protein sequence likelihood models. So if we start with just sequence-based models, the idea here is to try to fill in the blanks within a protein sequence by training using mask language modeling. This is similar to what uh, ChatGPT is doing, and I'm sure you're all quite familiar with that. And I know that, uh, you know, we assume that proteins are like sentences and the amino acids are like words. Now, just like in a sentence, uh, there are some words that belong and some words that are unlikely and some words that don't belong. So in the example of uh, a knight used a blank to defeat the villain, you know, we might think there's a 50% chance that he used a sword, a 2% chance that he used a spoon. And, you know, using a went doesn't make any sense at all, given the sentence. So we think that's similar with proteins. Some residues make sense. Some residues don't. And if we extend this analogy, oh, sorry. Uh, so there are hundreds of billions of protein sequences that we can use to train these types of models. And so even, you know, despite that this is, you know, not very rich information in terms of just the sequence, we have so many examples that we can very effectively explore what the natural looking domain of sequences are um, and train very complex transformer models uh, with high generality and, you know, easy inference with just knowing the sequence of your protein. But if we were to extend this analogy to evolutionary models, we can capture additional information about what evolution has allowed to occur uh, between different proteins. So the evolutionary process randomly samples different mutations. That's, you know, natural mutagenesis. And you, you, you don't see any examples of sequences where the function of the protein was reduced or in particular, the stability was lost. Because in that case, we would not have a functional protein anymore and it does not show up in the evolutionary record. You know, going back to the previous analogy, what we do here is we sort of find a bunch of similar sentences, a bunch of similar sequences. Maybe we would have found them in a book or something. And we can look at other opportunities to fill in that blank with uh, with similar sentences, with similar words that were uh, encountered in similar contexts. Uh, but in this case here, the advantage we get is that we are definitely preserving the function of the protein because we would have to have seen it in nature. And finally, for structure-based models, uh, we have, you know, we model the protein as a graph. Because as I mentioned, it has this three-dimensional structure. And in order to inform the context of what residues belong and form good interactions for stability, we need to look at what's especially close by to our residue that we're interested in mutating. And, you know, along with our analogy, this would be like looking at a picture and trying to fill in what the blank is in that picture instead. Um, now, it's not always what we expect to be in the picture. You know, we have some, you know, suboptimal residues within our proteins, our natural proteins, but for the most part, these are going to be close to the best choices that we have for residues to substitute into the protein. Okay, so let's talk about what we know about these models relative to the best existing stability models that are actually trained on uh, specifically to do stability and how we can use them to efficiently engineer carbonic anhydrase while we only have a limited throughput. So, for example, Rosetta Cartesian DDG is sort of a simulation method where you try to explore the different conformations that residues can take on and understand using a force field how the residues interact, you know, on average throughout these different conformations. And so it's a very rigorous method and it's quite accurate and trusted, um, but it's trained on a limited amount of data. Uh, the same data that most models are trained on and it's very limited. But, you know, comparing these protein sequence likelihood models, which you can see in green, uh, all of these models have similar performance to Cartesian DDG while taking only a small fraction of the time to run and being trained not to do stability prediction at all, just what the likelihood is in nature, which is quite surprising and impressive. So to briefly go over it, that this NDCG is an estimate of its ability to prioritize stabilizing mutations within the top few predictions. I'll talk about that a bit more in a second. The AUPRC is the ability to compromise between detecting stabilizing mutations and not detecting uh, destabilizing mutations. And finally, the, the weighted Spearman row, that is just a ranking overall from least to best. How well does the model perform? And so we see that PSLMs are actually excellent zero-shot predictors of stability. Despite not learning this property intrinsically, they do still capture it just by the natural viability. Okay, so what's... Especially surprising is that if we look at just the top few, so if we were to score all the possible mutations for a protein, there are you know potentially hundreds of thousands for a large protein, uh, and we were to take the top 10% of mutations from there, uh, 
the PSLMs, in particular, one called Protein MPNN, this is a structural PSLM based on the structural context, will improve the free energy of folding, the free energy barrier before that enzyme unfolds by about 0.2 kilocalories per mole on average, higher than Rosetta, which is barely even above zero. Um, and hence, Rosetta isn't very useful for actually engineering improved enzymes in practice. Now, that barrier increase is not very high and wouldn't lead to much increased thermal stability, maybe a couple of degrees. But uh, when you start to combine mutations together, and there's a whole bunch of mutations above this 90th percentile, as I mentioned, there's potentially a thousand, um, these will accumulate to improve the stability substantially. And, and uh, briefly, you know, I talked about the trade-offs of these uh, traditional models and the fact that they have this bias that tends to make worse mutations. All I really want you to understand from this is that, you know, the dominant class in the training data of, of good mutations that stabilize proteins are hydrophobic, uh, hydrophobicity increasing mutations that occur on the surface of the protein. And while these do improve stability, they tend to reduce the solubility and the function of the protein. And so Rosetta captures that same bias because it was trained using similar data, but PSLMs, uh, these likelihood-based models, are not preferring those types of residues. They prefer residues that are common in nature, and those residues tend to make the protein more soluble and more active. Okay, and, and just briefly, all I want you to understand from this slide is that if you can naively combine almost any combination of PSLMs and traditional methods. So for example, combinations of Rosetta and all the different structural PSLMs here, they have a higher overall stability increase when we look at a whole data set, uh, approximately 50% higher increase than if we just look at the combination of Rosetta with itself or no combination. Um, so it's probably because their training data are so different and they bring together complementary pieces of information. So to, to summarize that part briefly, Structure-based PSLMs are about as effective as the best traditional methods for modeling stability, but they do so without trading off the important things like stability and functionality that we need to still maintain within to have success within industry. And one PSLM in particular is excellent at prioritizing mutations, but we can combine them with traditional approaches, almost uh, uh, you know independently of which you combine, and achieve state-of-the-art performance. Okay, so why do these models work? Because remember, we're trying to model the natural likelihood. So these models are trying to increase the natural likelihood of a sequence. Um, but how can you engineer unnatural stability from that? And I think the reason is that uh, natural proteins will reduce their stability and lose their function until they reach this marginal level uh, where any further losses in stability, for example, would be deleterious to the organism. Because remember, this is about evolution naturally. This is about what enzymes are viable in nature. But we can look at other examples from throughout the domains of life and see better examples of how residues can interact, spe uh, specifically with the structure-based models are excellent at that. Um, and they can help correct for some of this random mutagenic effect that brings stability down to a baseline level. Okay, let's talk about how to actually apply these methods uh, to improve carbonic anhydrase and achieve uh, stable proteins in vitro that could be used for carbon capture. So we chose four mutations to assess based on the best predictions from various models. So for example, L25G is the best combination from evolutionary models. These are the ones that are focused on fitness. Uh, while the structure-based models are focused more on residue interactions, and we see that this L70K mutation on the surface, that's a uh, leucine to lysine uh, was, uh, uh, was the num also number one ranked according to just uh, averaging overall predictions. And, and finally, I'll just draw your attention to this Q86F from Rosetta. This is the choice from the traditional model. So remember, we often have problems with those. And I want to highlight that we have to see success within just a few mutations because uh, it takes weeks potentially to, char to characterize each mutation. So one problem that we often encounter when we try to express new mutant proteins is that they don't express it solubly, uh, solubly at all. And what I mean by express is to uh, cause an organism to uh, create this enzyme for us, because one big advantage of enzymes is that they can be easily produced from organic feedstocks just by providing these to organisms and allowing them to combine the ingredients together to produce this catalyst for us. And Typically, we might see that, you know, for some of our proteins, they mostly only have insoluble expression. But for all of our proteins, they were quite soluble, about as much as the wild type, which is the unmutated SASCA protein. But what I think is very interesting 
is that if we look at the activity, the residual activity uh, for an esterase assay of this enzyme uh, after incubating at various temperatures uh, for half an hour. So, you know, imagine, you know, in our flue gas application, we need to incubate at, you know, close to 95 degrees or something and thermally cycle up for half an hour. Um, we see that the wild type protein, so the natural unmutated one, is losing most of its activity around uh, 90 degrees Celsius. Whereas for all of the mutant proteins, they appear to have a little bit better stability beyond this point. And in particular, uh, this L70K mutation, this is just one single change to the residues of the protein uh, is, it, is allowing it to have quite a bit of residual activity, even at 97, where it became difficult to test because the water starts to boil. Um, so uh, meanwhile, this Q86F, this came from Rosetta, which is a traditional method, and we saw a uh, common outcome, which is that this protein starts to aggregate at low temperatures because it has hydrophobic mutations near the surface. So overall, it looks like uh, carbonic anhydrase as a you know potential renewal carbon sequestering catalyst has more potential to be used in industry now that we can better engineer its stability. And I mean, this is just the beginning of being able to engineer it. We tried some single mutants um, to try to, you know, prove that this method works. But in practice, we would apply many mutations at the same time and try to achieve something that maybe lasts at 120 degrees Celsius for a long time. And, you know, despite the fact it's already quite stable, we were able to achieve for at least one out of three mutants, but probably, you know, these, these other two as well, um, it, it, an increase in stability that was substantial. Um, and so overall, you know, you can bring in that this pre-training objective of modeling contextual residue likelihoods for enzymes is probably a powerful augmentation technique for developing more stable protein-based catalysts as we move into a more renewable future. So yes, thank you, everyone. That's it. Oh.